Good morning, it's September the 15th. And I wanted to talk about a couple of things today. I've been away on vacation for a while. And I came back after some heavy rains. And... Some of my figs were spoiled. This is my Peter's honey, a lot my larger in 7A in New Jersey. And there's some nice figs here that I could eat. Actually, I've been eating them. We got back last night and ate a bunch last night and this morning. But I wanted to talk to you about the splitting. Now we are at my Rondi Bordeaux and it is not splitting. If you could have seen how many figs I've had to throw away, uh, mostly of the Mount Etna types and one or two other varieties, but there was a great deal of spoilage from the heavy rains here. We were unlucky and unfortunately some of the rains that fell that missed certain places didn't miss here. We got a lot of rain when I was away, but but these these figs, these, which by the way, here it is, September the fifteenth, and you need to look at this because I'm going to say it again. Ron de Bordeaux is one of the most valuable figs I have in my collection, both in containers and in ground. There's just nothing, <laughs> nothing that that competes with it. Not in all of the categories that you look for to successfully grow figs in a zone. Other zones, I don't make any claims. But in this zone, zone 7A or B, just look at all the, I mean, it's September the 15th. And remember, every year, my Rondi Bordeaux, is, they're the first main crop figs. This year, this fig over here, a work. And it's still making some figs too, not as many. But it's still making, let me get on the other side of this fence, or, or net. And uh, it's a nice fig. It doesn't taste as good as Ron de Bordeaux. And, and, but it's it's a sealed fig. The, 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 it doesn't uh, succumb to the weather as badly as many other varieties. So it has its attributes. And this year, it was a day or two earlier than my Ron de Bordeaux. And I would suspect that it probably will next year, being that it's right next to the brick house. And the brick house retains a lot of heat. And so it's going to probably be earlier than other varieties that aren't as close to the house and don't benefit don't benefit from that micro climate. In fact, this one gets partial shade from a from a persimmon tree next to me. But it is each year my earliest fig usually and it was beaten out by a day or two by the O'Rourke. Still, notwithstanding it is the earliest, I think, if, you, if all things considered and if you fairly uh, judge them or they are in the same environment, it's the earliest. It's, 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 a, it's a very early cultivar. And here we are, September the 15th, and it's still pumping out lots of figs. I have another in ground. This is fully in ground. I have another one. Let's take a bite of this. And it's so much better than the Mount Etnas. The seed crunch, the taste, everything about it. This French fig is superior. I'm surprised it's not touted very much. Well, actually, I'm not that surprised. But I'm telling you, all my viewers out there, Absolutely, completely, entirely, put this 
variety in your collection. If you have a place in ground, put it in the ground from 7A warmer. And if you don't, put it in a container. It's one of the best performing container figs I've ever had of, in all my life, ever. I love it. Are there slightly better tasting figs out there? Yes. But are those figs, are those, not by much. I happen to like this, and this happens to be my, my wife's favorite, too. Uh, but I, I'm not going to claim that it's tastier than a Italian 258 or Genovese Nero, which is the same as Italian 258, in my opinion. Black Madeira or Preto, and they are, those two are nearly the same, if not the same. And some other, fig, mm, this one's so good. Wow. This is so good. Mm, that's good. But they are delicious. They're just, just a notch below. But so much easier to grow in this environment. In New Jersey, where it's hot and humid in the summertime, but cold springs, cold falls. And rain, rain, bad weather, inclement weather. And the other varieties that I mentioned are late, except for Smith. Smith is also a very tasty variety, which is a little earlier. It's in between. It's a mid-season. It's later than Rondi Bordeaux. And you want to have a mixture. So you want to have the earliest figs. The earliest, of course, I say, you should have, in my opinion, no question, is you should have a San Pedro type. And I like Dessert King. Desert King, Dessert King, whatever you prefer. But Desert King is a San Pedro type which produces extremely early a numerous amount of Briba. And the crop is so big, it's like any other main crop uh, that you could grow from any other variety. It's a huge... Breba crop, one of the largest, the largest that I know of, except for Feliciano Bianco. Feliciano Bianco was very closely related, but I've talked about this and covered this in other videos. You should have one of those in your collection so that you get figs, lots of big figs ripe around the 4th of July and a week before and a week after. But then you should have Rondi Bardot. If you're in my zone, particularly, these, this is a good strategy, not necessarily in other zones. And then you want to have something like Smith that's mid-season that will get right, right after Rondi Bardot. But Smith doesn't last too long. It's, it's a wonderful cultivar, but it's, it's finished, pretty much finished in a few weeks. Two or three weeks is pretty much done. But that's okay, because then you have your later figs come in. And look, my point is... My point specific here today, and the reason why I'm making this video, here it is, September the 15th, and you're still getting plenty of ripe Rondi Bordeaux. It just keeps pumping out the fruit. And they don't crack as much. They don't split as much. And even when they do, they don't taste bad. They don't spoil quickly. Like, like, let me show you here. This is not a real bad example of splitting. Remember, I was away a little bit. Quite a long bit. And these haven't been taken care of properly. And you can see that they're splitting here. Look. Why don't you see that with the Rondi Bordeaux? Look. This is Alma. Let me throw these away. And you see splitting, and it's kind of hard to do this with okay, one hand. And here's more splitting, and more splitting. Can you see it? And I could bring you over to my other fig varieties. This all has to be thrown away. All these have to be thrown away. And show you the same thing. But I'll bring you over here to another in-ground Rondi Bordeaux. And please, look at all these figs ripening. 
not ripening, ripe. Look, beautiful. Mmm, I love this variety. I mean, in my zone, this is just, I don't know how to say it. It's, it's made to order. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't ask for a better fig, practically. Okay, if every one of these tasted as good as a Black Madeira, I guess I could order that, sure. But they're not far away, and they have a different taste. It's a distinctive taste, and I love it. And I would not want to sacrifice that taste, not for any other taste. And the seed crunch, wonderful. I just cannot sing the praises of this variety any louder than I have. And there's a reason why I keep doing that. Because I want each and every one of you out there to put this variety in your collection. And it's cheap. It's inexpensive. Mmm. My God. That's so good. Mm. Some of these, when fully ripened, nearly rival the taste of Italian 258. Rival the taste of Smith. And nearly rival the taste of Black Madeira. Now the Coldy Doms and other varieties, I mean, they have great taste. I know that. I've grown them before and I've, I don't have them anymore in my collection. I, I don't have a lot of those types of figs in my collection. I've even weeded out a lot of the Adriatic types because they're late, too late, and they tend to split, split too much. And so I've abandoned them, not all of them. Uh, right now I have a Bataglia green that I have in the ground for the season, fully in the ground, and it's splitting pretty badly. But in the greenhouse, it performs magnificently and it's very, very delicious. So you get to know which ones to put out in the rain or leave out in the rain and which ones to shelter from the rain when you can. And that's what being a figster is all about. An experienced figster. You learn. <laughs> you learn what you need to do to make the most of your season and to make the most of your varieties. That's so important. Now this is my Peter's honey, which is not completely petered out, no pun intended, but it's it's getting towards the end. It's still pumping out figs, not as many as you can see, not as many as Ron de Bordeaux, but each and every one of them is a prize to me. I love variety. I, I love having variety. I mean, I like having different figs in my collection as long as they are suitable and they, they are adaptable to my climatic requirements. Let me change that to climatic demands because I think that's a better description. In this climate there are climatic demands and they have to be fulfilled if you truly want to be a successful fig gardener. If you want to have figs. Figs, 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 figs. I said it a billion times. Figs. See that little drop of honey right there? Peter's honey. Mmm. That is a delicious fig. Mmm. I so much prefer these over so many other varieties. Um, let me put you on pause for a little bit, and I want to, I've actually cleaned off all of my Mount Etnas today. This morning I, I got rid of so many bad figs, but there were other varieties too. But I, I think you have the point, and you probably had this happen to you too, if you're in my zone, or close to my zone. Uh, you want figs that don't crack and split as much. You want reliable figs that produce for a long period of time. You want early figs, early, early, early. You want figs 
that exhibit superior qualities of taste and quality and performance that perform that uh, produce abundantly and we've been talking about a lot of different varieties over the years some are very very good some aren't so good I've been weeding out a lot for my collection I've been doing that for years and years and years I've already weeded out so many varieties I don't claim to have grown 200 or 300 varieties and I think that's a plus but I have grown I must admit over a hundred varieties for sure and many of them did were not suitable and they failed in my environment now I'm not talking about another environment in, a, in, a, in an environment where they can become caprified by the fig walls the caprification can save these varieties or the, the fact that they're grown in California and places like that where it's hot and they have extended long periods uh, long seasons well that's a different matter and I never claim that I know a lot about those zones. I've read a lot extensively. I do know that you can successfully grow a lot more varieties there. I mean, it stands to reason than you can here in New Jersey or in 7A. Simple, it's simple. It's, it's, it's not anything that requires a lot of brain function, okay? Longer seasons, hotter seasons produce better figs and more varieties that are successful because you just can't grow, successfully grow, figs that have a very, very, very long season in this short, short season zone. Can't do it. You can stick them in a greenhouse. You can do whatever you want. You're not going to, you're not going to have the quality of an in-ground fig tree grown in California. So I've abandoned those varieties long ago, the ones that I feel just aren't suitable or adaptable to my climatic demands and that's my recommendation that you do that stick with varieties that work well in your specific climatic zones reach out reach out to people like me and friends or neighbors or people down the street or in the next town find out what they're growing successfully and and just emulate what they do just do that do what they do and stay away from the failures and you're fortunate enough that because of the internet today and because of wi-fi and because of youtube and all these wonderful new inventions which i never had the benefit of in my earlier years of being a fixture you have this wonderful 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 benefit a technological marvel that you can utilize and is at your disposal for learning from other people's mistakes and successes. That's right. You can do that. You can see it. <laughs> it's, it it's actually a, a modern day marvel. It, it, it honestly is a marvel. All of us take it so much for granted. But it's just an incredible tool. That we can utilize in a million fashions in a million different applications and for also growing organic foods and figs and persimmons and other things that other vegetables and such that we need to sustain us in this day and age of chemicals and contamination and pesticides and insecticides and herbicides you want to learn how to do organic things on your own. You want to be self-sufficient as much as you possibly can. And the internet is a means of focusing and concentrating on your own efforts to produce results like others have already successfully done before you. How wonderful. What a resource. I wish I had that resource. I wish when I was teaching school I had that resource. I didn't. Because I could have extended that resource to my students and it could have been, it could have been such a, a wonderful opportunity to expand upon my teaching techniques. Instead they had to listen to the poor things, 
they had to listen to my lectures incessantly. <laughs> like you. <laughs> but I didn't have anything else to... I didn't have any other tools. Okay? I could have given the poor souls a break. But you have it at your disposal. All kidding aside. And utilize them. Learn from other people's mistakes and learn from their successes. This is uh, Celeste. It's all done. All done. I see a couple little tiny little figs. They'll come to fruition later on, but nothing significant to speak of. All finished. Different varieties. They perform different tasks. Different functions. They fulfill different functions. They're gap figs. You can call them whatever you like. But you need to have some gap figs over your season, wherever you are, that some get ripe earlier and some get ripe later, providing that they get late in time, I mean, get ripe in time enough and not too late. If they're too late, just dump them. Don't grow them. Don't waste your time. Believe me. Learn from my failures. I, I grew so many. I was in an exchange program 20 years ago. I was exchanging. And with... Uh, UC Davis and I was writing back data to them they were sending me cuttings long 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 time ago and unfortunately when I wrote back to them because they wanted to know about the adaptability the regional adaptability of certain varieties and I had to report back to them Unfortunately, negatively, that certain varieties just didn't perform here. And I, and I had them at one time over here, and I'm not kidding you, one little bit. I have photographs, which I intend to post in the future, and some videos. But I had 37 covered varieties. Imagine that. I must have been an imbecile. Maybe I am an imbecile. But I had 37 varieties that were covered, separate, individual varieties, from UCD and I did everything I could to keep them alive so that I could have a harvest in the spring and summer or in the summer and many of them just died to the ground and failed keep in mind that very few figs die all the way including the roots especially if you put a little bit of mulch winter mulches which is the only time I ever mulch I never, ever, ever, never, ever mulch. Never. Not in my container. Ever. But that, that's another video. And everybody, each to, each to their own. But that's another subject. And maybe I'll expound upon that subject in the future. I would like to. But I don't. And But in the wintertime, I do. I put a little bit of mulch, you know, at the bottom of the trunk or trunks to protect from winter dieback protect the roots because even if the branches die all the way down in a severely cold winter or a normal winter around here sometimes unless they're covered uh, the roots won't die I've never had where the roots died from the winter it always will bring up new sprouts which is good for having on hand uh, you're going to have that variety you know into perpetuity because even if the old wood dies back you're still going to have the new shoots that emerge from the soil in the spring and then you can make cuttings or do air layering or whatever you want to do if you should ever want to retry that variety but that's what happens during trials and many of them eventually though just simply got discarded is my point okay thank you for visiting i wanted to talk to you a little bit more about these little babies I guess I could do a just a real quick walk around here under my glorious persimmons tree, my sejo, and I love my sejo. I won't talk any more about them right now. I have other videos. Look at look at all the fruit on this thing. Look at them. It's just so heavily laden with fruit everywhere, everywhere. This tree is monstrous, and I've recommended this tree ad nauseum over and over again please put in it if, if you're in 7a or quarter you can go a, a zone or two colder this is a this is the the most winter hardy period japanese purely 100 percent japanese 
persimmons, there is. There's nothing more winter hardy. It's hardy to 10 below zero, they say. Okay, I go down to a few degrees below zero in my zone. I've never had any dieback on one single branch. Look, look how, look, look how productive it is. But let's look down here. I mentioned in a previous video, and I've got to close this. I don't want these videos to run too long. I got so much more I want to talk to you about today. So much more. I'm gonna to have to make two or three more videos. There's a lot. I've got some persimmons that are getting ripe. Anyway, in one of my previous videos, I talked about trialing smith in 7b and i am trialing smith about five weeks ago maybe six i planted smith in the ground in 7b and it's it's adapted very well it's taken root it's doing very very well it had two tall branches there were several branches on the tree and i clipped off i mentioned that in that other video i clipped off the top and i just stuck these these cuttings in the ground I, two of them, and they're doing fantastically. They've taken root. They're, they're putting on new growth. One of them needs a little bit of nitrogen, I see, but I'm not feeding them any fertilizer. You don't do that with new... You don't put these cuttings in the ground and fertilize them. It'll burn the roots, the little roots that, that evolve in the beginning. But they're doing marvelously these two smith cuttings that i took from the top of the tree that i planted in 7b to experiment and trial it for winter with no cover no cover no wrapping i think it will survive we will see and i will keep you informed if it does it's a huge breakthrough but here are the two cuttings that came from that and this is what i did this was hard okay I took a stick like this, a piece of bamboo, I, I jammed it down in the ground and made a little hole or a little path for the cutting to be pushed down into. I pushed the two cuttings down and that was it, okay? So how's that for a sophisticated technique? They call it the old Italian man method. I guess I fit that description. So if that's what it is, that's what it is, we'll call it that. But it works. I've been doing it for 50 years, and it always works. It's very simple. So if you have cuttings and you want them to grow, now look, you will notice that there's very little sunshine here. See a little bit of sunshine? It's basically almost midday now. And you see all the shade? And that's because I planted them deliberately under this huge sejo tree. Okay? Not completely under it but at the outer fringes of it the outer fringes straight down there you go but the sun is on the other side because we're closer now to the winter solstice or as close almost as we are from the summer solstice so the sun isn't directly overhead it's more that way to the south and I knew that when I planted these because I wanted them to remain predominantly in the shade during the daytime. Just get little bits of morning sun and afternoon sun and through the leaves sun, through the branches sun, here and there, not much, so that they would be able to survive. That's how we propagate in midsummer. That's another method that we can use. I, I have another video on other methods. Over here, I'm looking here, and this needs some water, but just for anybody out there that might regard this information as important or valuable to them, here, let me show you, here are some uh, crepe myrtle uh, cuttings. I put quite a few of them in the ground. There's some more over here, if you can see them. There's a lot of weeds growing around them, but they survived. I put the cuttings in the ground. There's some more there and there. That's a weed. Here we go. They survived. I'm going to give them some water. It has rained here, as you can see. And uh, so they're okay. But they've survived for weeks, which means they've survived. And now they're a beautiful color. Fantastic. Sometimes I show them the color of this one 
in my videos. And so I'm looking forward to transplanting them in the spring. Now they will winter here as these little cuttings will too. I will not disturb them. It's too late in the year. What I will do is put a little barrel over them or a little trash can and I'll put some corn chaff or something over top of them uh, or and leaves and pack it around them and I'll put that because they're low to the ground they should survive the winter and because it's mostly hard wood they should survive and then I'll dig them up in the spring and put them in pots and get them started or maybe even in the ground okay thank you very much for your visit I hope I mentioned some things that were interesting to you today so with that I've got other videos to make and grass to cut and so much work to get caught up on. Thank you for visiting. Take care. Good day.